Now before we go to read chapter nine, let me summarize some of the things that we've been talking about, especially in chapter eight. That was a very long chapter that we did last week. Uh, chapter eight of John, we see Jesus having a dialogue with a variety of people, and I've told you this gospel, uh, the way John writes it, is Jesus is having a dialogue with different people, and John records you know, what Jesus said, what they said, what he said back to them, what they said back to him, it's just a series of dialogues that go on uh, back and forth. We also see when we study the book of John, the continual cycle of the revelation of his person along with the belief and disbelief of people. In other words, what John is showing is, uh, and the way he shows it is through dialogue. He shows that Jesus demonstrates that he's the son of God, either through a miracle or a teaching, something like that. And then he shows how people reacted to that. Some believed, and he talks about how they believed, what they said, what the believers said, and then some disbelieved. And that continual cycle goes through every single chapter. Jesus demonstrates His divinity, some people believe, some people disbelieve, it just goes round and round. So in chapter eight, we see three different examples of this cycle of revelation, belief, and disbelief being carried, uh, being carried out. First of all, the um, Pharisees are trying to entrap him with the charge against the woman caught in adultery. And what happens? They're outwitted by Jesus, and what do they do? Well, they leave in disbelief. The woman, however, the woman remains behind. She's charged with adultery, but she goes away with forgiveness, and we're hoping, uh, certainly, uh, a measure of faith. So there's the, you know, there's the belief and the disbelief being demonstrated. Then Jesus speaks to the crowd, he encourages them to believe in him, and he continues with the dialogue about the source of his life. And once this dialogue is over, again, John records some of the people disbelieved, but others began to believe in him initially. Then what, what's really interesting is that John demonstrates that, that Jesus then talks to the people who said, you know, we believe in you. And so he carries on another conversation with those people who said, we believe in you. And what happens? He, he challenges them to obey His, if you believe in me, he says, basically, then I challenge you to obey my word. If you obey my word, then you prove that you really are my disciples and I'll set you free. But in saying that, the people stumble over this demand because of their pride. They feel, you know, as descendants of Abraham, they have no need for somebody to deal with their sins. You think that's unusual? I remember once speaking to a woman a long time ago, I think she was a therapist, I had some physical therapy done, and, 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 and she was Jewish. I lived in Montreal in those days. And she said, oh, you're a Christian, you're a minister, blah, 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 we talked and this and that. And so I was just you know, probing a little bit, seeing what, what she believed as a Jewish person. And she flat out said to me, she says, oh, I, I, I'm not interested in Christianity. And then she said, because I'm not interested in anybody ha having to die for my sins. I don't need that. I said, really? I said, why is that? She says, well, because I keep the law. And I was like taken aback. You know, I only thought that mindset was in the Bible, but uh-uh. You know, it was like in the modern day. She says, I don't need him to die for my sins because I obey the law. And I was thinking, wow, she <laughs> I was amazed. Same mindset as you see Jesus dealing with here in the Bible. And so uh, these people in the Bible, uh, John shows that um, uh, they, 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 they're the ones who said, we believe in you. And then when he says, if you obey me, I'll free you from your sins. Then they say, what do you mean? You don't need to free us from our sins. We've never been slaves. We're Abraham's children. You know, we're, we're Jews. We're culturally, you know, no one's ever had us or enslaved us. And so the same people who believe in Him quickly turn against Him because they're unwilling to acknowledge their sin of pride. You know, when they see the miracle, they say, man, we're in. Yeah, you're the man, we're in. You know? But then when He pushes them a little bit and pokes them a little bit, and you know, they have to give up something, their pride, well, they're, they're out again. So we find out at the end of the chapter, chapter eight, that the very people who began to believe in him quickly turned against him and actually were prepared to kill him because of what he said. Now, I said last week, and we, 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 I mean, we did it in like two minutes, I didn't have a lot of time. I said that um, there are some lessons that we can draw from this dialogue, even though it repeats the cycle and the pattern of discussions that Jesus had with people throughout the lesson. A Couple of lessons from that. 
Lesson number one was that Jesus came for forgiveness, not for judgment. The story of the adulterous woman, we, in that story we see that Jesus' purpose in coming was to obtain forgiveness for sin. Now a lot of the, the problem with that is some people who read the Bible see only that. They say, well, you know, Jesus is love, Jesus you know, came to forgive, you shouldn't judge. They only see that part. They don't realize that there is going to be a judgment to come in the future. But the primary reason for Jesus' appearance was to open the gate to allow forgiveness and grace to come into a person's life. There'll be judgment, all right, but it wasn't, with, you know, it wasn't during that moment. It, it isn't during Jesus' first coming that the judgment comes. That's when forgiveness comes. That's when forgiveness is you know, brought into the world. The next time He comes, that's when the judgment is going to, uh, is going to uh, take place. Uh, another lesson that we uh, can see from that, obedience is what separates you know, the men from the boys, as they say. This crowd, they were ready to be with him because they saw the miracle, we're all in. The moment he pushed them a little bit and talked about obeying him, uh, they, didn't, they didn't like that idea. And again, nothing new there. Regardless of what people say about their religious convictions or their Bible knowledge, it's their obedience to God's word that determines their relationship with God. You can be spouting scripture all day, all day long you know, that you've memorized in Sunday school, blah, 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 but that doesn't mean anything to God in the sense that if you don't accompany that with obedience to His word. If we do what God wants us to do in worship, in ministry, in our relationships with people, it's by this obedience to Him that we prove that we're His people and not simply by claiming that we're His people. You know, people sometimes are real loud about that. Praise the Lord, you know, and they, they just they love to kind of draw attention to themselves because I'm a believer and they carry a 30 pound Bible with them all over the place, you know, and that's, you know, if that's what you want to do, that's fine. But obedience to the word, that's, that's really where it's at as far as Christianity is concerned. And then one other lesson, Jesus continually tests His disciples. Even the people who said they believed in Him were subject to Jesus' tests. He challenged them to come to a higher level in depending on Him for their salvation. And of course it was their offended pride that turned them against Him. You know, they failed the test and consequently they turned against the Lord. And so the modern application is a lot of times in our lives we're tested by the Lord in what we say and what we do or how we respond or react to Him. He tests us all the time. We think the only test is when uh, we, we hear the gospel and we're encouraged to obey it you know, by repenting of our sins and being baptized. We think that's the only test. And once we've done that, He'll never test us again. But boy, that's just the beginning. He's always poking around in our lives, in our sins, in our attitude, in our you know, commitment to service and so on and so forth. He's always doing that to try to you know, uh, uh, get us to, to step up, so to speak. So we need to be conscious of this and remember that at any, at any time He can test our faith. And um, if we find ourselves falling away or neglecting Him or putting less emphasis on His word or growing cold in the love for Him, we can be sure that we're failing that test. Another thing I'll tell you just from personal experience, the test rarely comes when you're strong and healthy and things are going right and you know, praise God, Lord, I'm so happy to be alive. That's usually not when the test comes. The test you know, to, to love, the test to forgive, the test to obey usually comes down in the valley somewhere where you know, can anything else go wrong you know, when you're saying that to yourself? Can, can this day get any worse? That's when the test comes, usually. All right. So we have to be careful about becoming complacent because as I say, that's when Jesus is testing us. But it's a great encouragement. It's a great encouragement because the minute you realize, oh wait a minute, I know what this thing is. This is a test of my faith. The minute we realize what it is, it usually gives us courage to, you know, what's the first thing to do? I, I ask for prayer. You know, I say, oh Lord, I'm being tested. Well, Lord, I need your help now. I really need your help. All right, so let's, let's move on to chapter nine, shall we? Chapter nine, in chapter nine, in chapter nine, uh, this chapter, this scene is divided into three sections. If, you're, if this was a play, there'd be three separate scenes. 
you know, they'd move the furniture around and everything to set up three different scenes. The first scene is Jesus heals a man who is uh, born blind. And John describes this miracle that he performs. Um, and this miracle will set the stage for a debate that will be carried on away from the presence of Jesus. So if this was a play, first scene, you see Jesus healing the blind man. Second scene, Jesus not even in it. You see people debating what happened, talking about it. So that's the debate, verses 13 to 34. John is going to describe a debate that will rage between the Pharisees and the people concerning the miracle that Jesus has done. And he would also describe the questioning that the man and his family undergo at the hands of the Jewish leaders. That's the second scene. And then the third scene is we go back to Jesus and he declares his deity. Once again, he's going to confront the man he healed, but this time he's going to reveal his person to that man. And then the chapter's going to close out with a final debate between Jesus and the Pharisees over what he has said and done. Then in chapter 10, we're not going to do that today, but chapter 10, it will also include a discussion between Jesus and these very same Pharisees and more declarations of His deity. And we'll see in chapter 10 uh, that it will end when Jesus will leave the area and go back to His ministry in another area of the country. So let's go to chapter 9, shall we? Verses 1 and 2. First part of the chapter deals with the actual miracle uh, Jesus performed. So it says, as he passed by, he saw a man blind from birth, and his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he would be born blind? So the question by his disciples sets up the teaching opportunity for Jesus. You have to understand, the Jews in those days believed that there was a direct correlation between infirmity and sinfulness. The question that the disciples were asking stemmed from the fact that he was born blind. So they thought if you were lame or if you had a disease or if you had leprosy, if you were blind, it was because of some sin that you did. You know, God was punishing you right away. And so the question that the, the disciples are saying is, well, if he was born blind, obviously there's nothing he could have done, you know, I mean he was born that way, then who was responsible for his infirmity? The sins of his parents or his own sins? You know, normal question for the Jews who believed that at that time. So let's see what Jesus answers. He says, it was neither that this man sinned nor his parents, but it was so that the works of God might be displayed in him. We must work the works of Him who sent me as long as it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. Where, uh, excuse me, while I am in the world, I am the light of the world. So Jesus doesn't answer this particular question because He would have had to explain that being born blind or becoming blind is a result of the fallen nature of man. Infirmity, weakness, death, all of that is because of our fallen nature, because of Adam's sin and so on and so forth. He doesn't explain that to them. Okay, that's a discussion for some other time. Jesus um, chooses not to explain this theological fact to His disciple, but rather uses the opportunity to focus the attention on His divinity. In other words, hey, there's a theological answer to that question, but right now the thing that you people need to understand is, I'm the Son of God. So we're going we're to redirect that back to, back to me. He tells them that in this particular case, the blindness is there to provide an opportunity to display the power of God. They assume that he'll be there for a long time and they continue his minute. You know, they think he's going to be there for, his, you know, where he's going to be there another 20, 30 years. They're, that's what their thinking is. Jesus, of course, understands that his ministry among them will be short lived and he has a lot of things to accomplish during that short time. That's why he said, This blindness is to give me an opportunity to demonstrate something to you because you need to understand stuff. I haven't got a lot of time here. So, uh, he builds again on the theme of light and the fact that He is the light of the world. The miracle that He's going to perform will demonstrate that He is the light of the world and His words are indeed true. In other words, the idea is, if I can heal this guy, you can believe what I say. That's really what it's all about. If I have the power to heal this person, then what I say, if I say it's the truth, I've demonstrated that what I say is true by power. 
Not, not by talking you into it you know, or, or persuading you. Uh, I've shown you the truth through a demonstration of power. So let's read six and seven. When he had said this, he spat on the ground and made clay of the spittle and applied the clay to his eyes and said to him, go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is translated sent. So he went away and washed and came back seeing. So a lot is said about the fact that Jesus made the clay mixture and applied it to the man's eyes and gave him instructions to go wash his eyes. I mean, could Jesus have just as easily said, you can see now? I mean, yeah, he could have said, go ahead, you can see. I mean, he, he healed others like that. He, he, he brought somebody back from the dead just with the words. Now most scholars believe that the reason Jesus went through this process is probably because he wanted the man to participate in his own healing. You see, having never seen, the man now is made aware that a miracle or an effort is being made to restore his sight. So putting the mud on his eyes has no medicinal purpose other than to give the man something to do as a response of faith. In the same way, you know, is there any magic in the water when we're baptized? Is that super water? Eh, it's just water from the tap, right? It's, it's our response of faith. You know, the gospel said Jesus is the Son of God. We say, I believe that. And the gospel says, well, demonstrate your faith. How? Well, by being baptized. In the same way here. So as we see the man going to the particular pool to do exactly what Jesus said, and the result is his sight is regained. He could have said, why do I have to walk all the way down to the pool of Siloam? Oh, it's crowded, it's hot, it's noon, I'm thirsty. Maybe I'll stop to my house for lunch. My mother will make some stuff. And we got water there. I'll splash my eyes when I get home. Remember what I said? We demonstrate our faith how? Obedience. So he obeyed what Jesus said for him to do. So the point here is that the miracle is done through the power of Jesus, but the man does make a response of faith in obeying Jesus' word by washing it off at the pool of Siloam. As far as the man is concerned, there's no doubt who has performed the miracle because he has been touched by Jesus, he has heard Jesus speak to him, he has responded to Jesus in obeying his command to wash the eye. In other words, if Jesus said, okay, you're healed, and all of a sudden he could see, who did this? One minute I, I'm blind, next minute I open my eyes, I see there's a bunch of people around this Jesus, I've never seen him, I don't know who he is. This way, he knows that he's gone through a process with the Lord. So now, in verse 8 to 12, it says, therefore the neighbors and those who previously saw him as a beggar were saying, is not this the one who used to sit and beg? Others were saying, this is he. Still others were saying, no, but he is like him. He kept saying, no, I'm the one. So they were saying to him, how then were your eyes opened? He answered, the man who is called Jesus made clay and anointed my eyes and said me, to me, go to Siloam and wash. So I went away and washed and I received sight. They said to him, where is he? And he said, I do not know. So notice in this passage, he says exactly what we've been talking about. I know who healed me. The guy who said, put the mud on my eyes and, and so on and so forth. Now John here is describing the reaction of the neighbors to the blind man. And you can see it's not a question of believing or disbelieving. They see clearly that he has sight. They just don't know who did it. There's a little bit of confusion as to who did the, the miracle. All right, so that's the first scene, the one where the miracle takes place. The next scene is the debate among the Pharisees. We're going to see here that this miracle is going to create controversy because it was performed when? on the Sabbath. So John describes the debate among the Pharisees in terms of two witnesses that the blind man makes about the one uh, when he's brought before the Pharisees. So what happens? He's healed, there's a commotion, they bring him in front of the Pharisees, the Jewish leaders, because they want to know what's going on here. So now you have some witnesses that are going to speak. So let's uh, take a look at the passage, verse uh, 13, it says, they brought to the Pharisees the man who was formerly blind. Now it was a Sabbath on the day when Jesus made the clay and opened his eyes. Now you know that they're always claiming Jesus is breaking the law because he's working on the Sabbath, because he healed on the Sabbath. Okay, keep reading 15. Then the Pharisees also were asking him again how he received his sight. And he said to them, he applied clay to my eyes and I washed and now I see. Therefore, some of the Pharisees were saying, this man is not from God because he does not keep the Sabbath. 
But others were saying, how can a man who is a sinner perform such signs? And there was a division among them. So they said to the blind man again, what do you say about him since he opened your eyes? And he said, well, he is a prophet. The Jews then did not believe it of him, that he had been blind and had received sight, until they called the parents of the very one who had received his sight, and questioned them, saying, is this your son, who you say was born blind? Then how does he now, how does he now see? His parents answered and said, we know that this is our son and that he was born blind, but how he now sees we do not know, or who opened his eyes we do not know. Ask him, he is of age, he will speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jews, for the Jews had already agreed that if anyone confessed him to be Christ, he was to be put out of the synagogue. For this reason his parents said, he is of age, ask him. So in this passage, the Pharisees questioned the blind man about his uh, miraculous sight, and he said, yes, I was blind, now I see. There is a great doubt about this, and so the leaders of the Jews want to question his parents to see if this is some kind of a trick. Is the followers of Jesus, you know, is this a put up job? Is this some sort of scam here going on? Okay, you said you were blind, now you see. Well, let's bring your parents forward and ask them some questions. So they don't answer all the questions. They say, yes, this is our son. Yes, he was born blind. How he sees, hey, we don't know. Ask him, he's an adult. They know how it happened. They're just afraid. They don't want to be put out of the, put out of the synagogue by the Pharisees. So in the end, they simply tell the leaders to question their son who is an adult who can speak for himself. So that's the first witness. Witness number two, let's read, keep going. Verse 24. So a second time they called the man who had been born blind. Two times now they questioned him and said to him, give glory to God, we know that this man is a sinner. He then answered, whether he is a sinner I do not know. One thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see. So they said to him, what did he do to you? How did he open your, um, your eyes? Uh, he answered and said to them, I told you already and you did not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you, want, uh, uh, you do not want to become his disciples too, do you? They reviled him and said, you are his disciples, but we are disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but as for this man, we do not know where he is from. The man answered and said to them, well, here is an amazing thing, that you do not know where he is from, and yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not hear sinners, but if anyone is God-fearing and does his will, he hears him. Since the beginning of time it has never been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a person born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. They answered him, you were born entirely in sins, and are you teaching us? So they put him, so they put him out. I, I love this passage. <laughs> Like this passage. Here's this guy, you know, the lowest of the low on the social ladder, a blind beggar. You couldn't get any, a leper maybe, it was lower than that. And here he is saying, You guys are so smart, you know, uh, I couldn't see and now I see. You know, how, how, do, how does a thing like that happen? Do you want to become his disciples too? And they say, Ah, you were a sinner from the very beginning. Get out of here. Well, you don't know what you're talking about. And so in the beginning they suggest that he may be lying. That term, you know, give God the glory or give glory to God, that was a Jewish kind of saying. What it really meant was, come on, tell the truth now. That's, that's, that's what they're saying. Tell them, you're lying, you've been put, you know, tell the truth. So in his second witness, the healed man is much bolder with the leadership and challenging them about the miracle that Jesus performed for him. We need to understand, he's the lowest of the low and he's talking to the leaders of the country, people he wouldn't be allowed to come within 10 feet of you know, just an hour or two before. Now he's debating with these, with these people. So the leaders claim superiority because they're disciples of Moses. They claim to know the law. In other words, you know, they, they don't get it. They just, you know, they can't see the forest for the trees, these guys. So in the end, Unable to resist his cold and clear logic, the Pharisees simply insult him and throw him out of the room. You know, it's the old idea, don't confuse us with facts, our minds are already made up. All right, so there's, this, there's the second scene. Okay, see, scene two. All right, I'm going to change the furniture around, everything, lights go out, people go for popcorn, they come back. Scene number three opens, verse 35 to 44. Now, 
you have to remember one thing. This guy has not yet seen Jesus with his new eyesight. Okay? He hasn't seen, he's heard him. He, know, he knows it's Jesus and so on and so forth. But when his eyes were finally open, where were they open? Well, they were opened at the pool of Siloam. He went there, washed his eyes, he could see. All right? So in this final passage, John describes the face-to-face -face meeting that the man does have with the one who healed him. All right, pick it up in verse 35. Jesus heard that they had put him out, and finding him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? He answered, Who is he, Lord, that I may believe in him? Jesus said to him, You have both seen him, and he is the one who is talking with you. And he said, Lord, I believe. And here's the important part of this verse. And he worshipped him. And he worshipped him. In this passage, there is a dialogue between Jesus and the man. Notice that Jesus calls on the man to believe in him, and the healed man not only acknowledges his faith, but John says he worshiped Jesus, and notice that Jesus doesn't say, no, 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 don't, oh no, you mustn't worship me, you know, I'm just a man, come on. You know, no. no, no, he accepts the worship. Yeah, I'm the right guy to worship. I'm the son of God. So the fact that he worshiped Jesus demonstrates that his faith was sincere. All right, verse 39. And Jesus said, for judgment I came into this world so that those who do not see may see and that those who see may become blind. Those of the Pharisees who were with him heard these things and said to him, we are not blind too, are we? And Jesus said to them, if you were blind, you would have no sin. But since you say we see, your sin remains. So in these few verses, Jesus uses several play on words that summarizes well the condition of those who believe and those who disbelieve. He equates those who believe with those who are able to see. Whether they're physically able to see or not, the fact that they believe means that they see what's important. And so the word see there is, is substituted for I understand, I believe. So those who understand and believe, they're the ones who really see regardless of their eyesight, how well their eyesight is working. And those who disbelieve are equated with those who are blind. Conversely, whether they're able to see or not, the fact that they disbelieve demonstrates that they're really spiritually blind because they can't see the truth. In the end, Jesus hurls an accusation against the Pharisees because they were complaining that this condemnation was hurled at them. He's saying, you know, you're talking against us. And he's saying, yeah, you know, again, another modern, if the shoe fits. You know, here's a tremendous miracle right in front of you, right in front of you, undeniable miracle. It's never been done in this country. And, 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 you're, and you're complaining that it was done on the Sabbath? Talk about being blind, not seeing the truth. So Jesus tells them, at least if you acknowledge that you did not know the truth, then you would be innocent in this matter. But because you boast that you are the guardians of the truth and yet you deny me, then you are charged and found guilty of this sin of disbelief. The whole idea, Jesus didn't come to bring the final judgment, but His presence on earth and what He did actually was a judgment in the sense that you either believed or disbelieved. And based on your belief or disbelief, you were judged already. You know, a lot of times as Christians we say, I, I hear Christians talk sometimes, oh man, the judgment, I hope I make it. I say, what do you mean you hope you make it? You've already made it. Yeah, but the judgment, we're not going to be judged. We've already been judged. We were judged the day we were in the water and, and, and somebody said to you, you believe that Jesus is the Son of God? And we said, yes, I believe that He is the Son of God. No more judgment, that was your judgment. And Jesus is saying right here, these Pharisees, never mind waiting to the final judgment, that's when the other shoe will drop. They've already been judged. They've come face to face with the Son of God and they've rejected Him. The judgment's already there. You've already been found guilty. Never mind if you uh, disobey the law, you steal, you, you, you commit adultery or whatever. We won't need those sins to condemn you. <laughs> You've already been condemned because the, the main thing that was put before you, you blew it, you lost it. And so in this final passage, we see Jesus not only declaring His divinity, but attaching to His declaration is the accusation that those who do not believe in His divinity, 
they are subject to condemnation. So in this way, Jesus is raising the stakes as far as the importance of believing in Him is concerned. For those who believe, there's great reward. And now, for those who disbelieve, condemnation is at hand. The important part is, up to this point in His ministry, He hasn't done that. He's invited people to believe, but He hasn't articulated the idea that if you don't believe, you'll be condemned. But here he does. So now you know, the stakes are higher now. Now he's raising the stakes. And of course, because he's raising the stakes, people who are against him, now they're really mad. Now they're really going to get him. So in this way, Jesus is raising the stakes as far as the importance of believing in him. All right, so we're going to stop here. Let me just do here. Uh, but this is really the middle part of this section about healing of the blind man. We don't have time to go through the entire thing. We'll have to pick it up next time. Jesus is going to continue his dialogue with the Pharisees in the next chapter and he'll continue to assert his divinity. For now, he leaves them with yet another uncontestable miracle that points to his divinity. And once again, the Pharisees are quibbling over the issue of when the miracle was performed rather than the power that it demonstrated. So the irony, of course, is that the person who was blind was able to clearly see the meaning of what had happened to him, and those who claimed to be leaders and visionaries of that society were clearly blind to what was taking place in front of them. All right, so the next time we get together, uh, we're going to finish up chapter nine and 10 and head into the final stages of Jesus' ministry. All right, that's it for lesson number 18. Thank you for your attention.